managing sexual and hormonal changes after age 40. Uh, the way I like to talk is very interactive. Um, that sounded like a really serious person, but I'm not. Let's make this fun. Uh, this is a topic that we don't get to talk about a lot, um, maybe with our girlfriends, but often not even with our gynecologists. So um, even though there's a format, I only have about four slides. Um, I haven't prepared what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk off the top of my head. And I'd like you guys to chime in anytime. I'm going to ask for your opinions or ideas. Uh, so I am required to uh, tell you some objectives. We'll just go through these quickly. Um, by the end of the day, um, we'll discuss the physiology and symptoms of menopause and perimenopause. We'll discuss how menopause and perimenopause affect sexual and holistic well-being. And we'll talk about some options for treatment, including the things that you can see there, hormone, surgical, and non-surgical vaginal rejuvenation, and other holistic approaches. And we can do other things too, so don't feel like we're stuck with that. That's just the guideline. Um, so we're all uh, here as students, so we'll go back to some of the basics of physiology just real quick. Um, just some definitions. Uh, anyone want to throw out a definition of menopause? There's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> Cessation of munsies, yeah, that's a good one. Flash hot, flash hot, flash. So, we get diagnosed based on symptoms. That's absolutely right. Any other? Decrease ovarian function. Decrease ovarian function, exactly. So, that's the, that's the underlying cause. Any other ideas or definitions? So, textbooks sometimes will say it's when we have not had a period for a year. I mean, obviously, these are like made up terms, but uh, what happens, um, as, as um, Susan mentioned, is our over, our ovaries stop ovulating. Uh, we're not fertile anymore, we're not producing eggs, and as a result, our hormone levels change dramatically. Uh, our estrogen and progesterone levels drop to minimal levels, and that causes hot flash, hot, right? <laughs> and, and a host of other symptoms. What about perimenopause? Anyone, anyone heard that term? Or what, what does that mean? It's like the 10 years prior to menopause and then you yeah. have a very irregular cycle. Exactly. So the time, like so you're not in you're not menopausal yet, so, but you're not having those youthful, regular every 28 day cycles. Not that everyone ever had that, but uh, we're not ovulating regularly, but we're still having periods, we're still producing some hormones, but it's very up and down, right? Very irregular and uh, like Virginia said it could be 10 years before we go through menopause. For some women even longer sometimes we start experiencing perimenopausal symptoms in our 30s. Um, some women never experienced that. I've had patients who felt absolutely normal and then their period stopped and that was that but they're very unusual. So there's a huge spectrum um, that, that presents during this time. Um, and then just going back to the start, what about menarche or puberty when we first have a period what what uh, you know this is kind of a duh question but what what's happening then when we're 12 13. Your ovaries yeah your ovaries wake up right you start <laughs> releasing eggs so technically you're fertile although that's terrifying for people like me with 13 year olds but we start having periods we're releasing eggs and if things are working like clockwork we release eggs every month until we get into this perimenopause phase and that starts being a little less regular and then menopause for that, right? So we've got the definitions figured out. So during, you know, what's happening to my hormones during this time? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. You guys remember from high school health class or hopefully uh, some better education after that if you went to my high school. Um, when we start ovulating, we start going through those cycles where you have the period, you release the egg. After we release the egg, we're going to produce that hormone progesterone, which is um, put there by nature to support the baby. It's pro gestational. Uh, if we don't get pregnant, the progesterone drops and we have a period, right? And then over it starts again. So every month, we're going through these cycles of producing estrogen and then progesterone after ovulation to support the baby. Now, if we do get pregnant, our progesterone, of course, stays high, and then the placenta takes over and so on. But that's what's happening in normal cycles. So what's happening to my hormones in perimenopause? So if we're not ovulating regularly, what are some things that are gonna happen? You'll have less progesterone. Yeah, less progesterone, right? And estrogen. Right, so sometimes what happens during this, uh, this perimenopausal phase is your estrogen might stay quite high and your progesterone is starting to drop and that can start causing a lot of unpleasant symptoms. So of course, later our estrogen drops as well. But during perimenopause, uh, we're not ovulating regularly, so not as much progesterone. Uh, when we have lots of estrogen and not as much progesterone, 
what kind of symptoms might we have during that phase? FSH goes up. Yeah, so right, if you're drawing your blood, your FSH goes up, that's right, follicle stimulating hormone, we'll talk about that a little bit more, that's that pituitary hormone that responds to, um, to our lowering or burning function. Um, mood swings, have you had any of those? Very common in, the, in the, um, what we call the luteal phase, the phase after uh, ovulation. Mood swings, sleep problems, progesterone is great for sleep, so insomnia is a very common complaint. Um, anyone here experience weight gain? The most common complaint that I hear in my office for women after 40 is weight gain, um, and that's also related to these changes in hormones. Um, hot flushes often don't start till a little bit later, because those happen when our estrogen levels dropping, but um, very common for patients in our 40s who are not, they might have 10 years to go till menopause, complaining of mood swings, irritability, sleep problems, starting to gain weight around the middle. You, you lose it from places you want it and then you stick it in places you don't, right? So very, very common. So that's what's happening to our hormones. We're not ovulating regularly, so that normal balance of estrogen followed by progesterone is, is off. So diagnosis and hormone testing, we talked about um, the, the, the standard for testing uh, where someone is in the menopausal spectrum, because it's like, it's a long time, right? it could be 10 or 15 years, is uh, FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, that's a blood test. Um, it, it, you know, the pituitary gland responds to uh, changing levels of estrogen, and we see FSH going up with time. So a young woman who's ovulating regularly is gonna have really low FSH, like numbers and, you know, under five, two, four, five. Once those numbers start getting over a ton, then something's going on. So especially if a patient is um, wondering if she's still fertile, say she's 38, 40, even 35. If her FSH is 12, now that's not, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell her she can't get pregnant, uh, but that's suggesting that her ovarian function's really starting to slow down. So we'd be looking at that patient, you know, really wanting her to get moving with some um, assistance with fertility because it shows that she may not have much time. Uh, there's another hormone we test called AMH, that you might have heard of, uh, that, that is also can indicate our ovarian reserve. Now, um, any of you guys seen or heard a lot of advertising for you know, very expensive hormone panels, maybe it can be saliva panels or uh, doctors that charge $2,000 or more to, to, to check all your hormones. You're right, we're not mentioning any names, but they're out there. Um, I'm, my opinion, which is not shared by everyone, but it is my opinion, it's not necessary. There's absolutely no evidence that you need to do anything other than just check an FSH. To tell you the truth, you don't even need to do that in most cases. The way I diagnose menopause in most patients is by listening to the patient. The patient will tell you what their lab result will be. So I often tell patients, you know, why spend money on a lab test if I know what the result's going to be? So if a 50-year-old patient comes in and has stopped having periods, I'm not going to check an FSH. That's a waste of money, because guess what? It's going to be, what? Uh -huh. Hot, right? So what's that going to tell you that you didn't already know? So I think it's, it, you know, we can often rely on our clinical judgment. So I tend to be more um, someone who listens to the patient um, and, and not so much looking at the piece of paper. But there are cases where um, it's confusing. You know, if a patient say 38 and she stopped having periods, what, what's the first thing you do? She's pregnant, right? Yeah, so in case she's not pregnant, checking an FSH might indicate whether she's going through menopause early. So it can be useful. Uh, but honestly, most of the diagnosis is, 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 yeah, listen. You can get an awful lot from listening to a patient uh, that the lab isn't gonna help you with. Um, and then we've talked a little bit about some of the, some of the common effects of these hormone changes. So uh, you know, in perimenopause, I talked about the effects of, well, progesterone lowering, mood swings, weight gain, sleep problems. Once we get a little further along in the spectrum, then our estrogen drops. That's when our periods are stopping or have stopped. So if you're 50, like me, um, my, you, know, you don't need to draw my blood. My estrogen level's like almost zero, and so is my progesterone level. So why is my progesterone almost zero? Because I don't ovulate, right? So if you go to a, uh, any clinic in your menopausal and they want to check your progesterone level, I would be very wary about their knowledge because <laughs> this happens all the time where patients will come in and say, I had this lab done at some doctor XYZ um, and my progesterone is too low and I'm 48 and so I need to take supplements or something like that. Well, 
you know, it's normal. Your progesterone is always low unless you're in that luteal phase. If you're 20 years old, your progesterone will be really low unless you check it after ovulation. So there's a lot of misconceptions about that. And it's constantly amazing to me what um, some medical practitioners are telling patients. But just, uh, you know, tell your friends and family. I would be very wary if someone wants to check your progesterone when you're not ovulating. Because you know what it'll be. Close to zero, right? Um, so, how about menopause? But, I, you know, I'll tell, I, I, I'm postmenopausal, so I can tell you my side effects. Any, any of our other ladies want to share some of the symptoms of menopause when we're in that low estrogen state? We talked about hot flashes, headaches, headaches, sleeplessness, sleeplessness, sleeplessness irritability. irritability. Yeah. What else? Yeah. No sex drive drops. Yeah. So I want to talk a lot about that actually. Vaginal dryness, and so that makes the tissue thinner, drier, and then how does sex feel when not fun, right? It hurts, and who wants to do something that hurts? So it's, a, it's a cycle that can lead to a lot of um, downstream effects in our relationships and the way we feel, so it's really, really important to, you know, we're gonna live to be 90 or 100 years old, right? We may spend half of our life in this postmenopausal state, so this, this is really important to address so we can stay vibrant, healthy, uh, sexually active if we choose to be, and there's absolutely no reason not to be if you want to. So we talked about hot flashes, temperature. So we have estrogen receptors from our head to our toes, our hair, our brain, our eyes, uh, our skin, of course, breasts, our GI tract, obviously a lot in the genital area. I mean, everywhere. So uh, everything changes, and the list of effects is, is different for each patient. I, mean, I, I have daily patients present with a menopausal symptom that may be quite unusual, but hey, it's hers, so she owns it. Joint pain, um, lack of muscle, loss of muscle mass. Anyone had that? Like, were you still fit in the clothes, but you're kind of flabby underneath. Like, so you, you've lost, you, we lose muscle. That, so the, a lot of things change. Um, and, you know, we can't turn back the hands of time, and a lot of these things can be addressed if we understand them so that we can live in the second half of our lives and be healthy and vibrant. So anyone have anything to add to that? They want to throw in a symptom that they've had? Or, so we hit the big ones, but I mean, head to toe. My hair changed. My skin changed. My, my old memory. I didn't talk about that. Anyone forgot their own phone number? <laughs> I so said that. Um, just for Very, very 
in this age group because relationships start to drift apart. So um, my mission is to address this through my study, and then hopefully we'll have a book next year that I can share with you. Uh, but yeah, the, you know, biologically, um, the universe is saying, I'm done. I'm not fertile, so what's the point? Um, physical changes, we go out of the way. So we talked about some of those. If, if, if we're low in estrogen, the vagina changes dramatically. The tissue gets thinner. If you take a biopsy and look at it under the microscope, the tissue that in a young woman used to be all plump and juicy with lots of mucus producing cells and it looked all like the inside of your mouth, all lovely and slippery, is now flat and thin. Uh, the nerves are close to the surface. Um, you can get cuts like little paper cuts just, just with any kind of friction. It hurts. And who wants to do that? The women who are not sexually active for long periods of time, the vagina actually can shrink or atrophy to a point where you can only get one finger in there. So, I, I mean, it, things change. So we lose blood flow, and this happens to men too. Now, men, men don't, I mean, just, men do not go through menopause. There's stuff in the news about male menopause. We, we own that term. Yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no. Okay. We own that term. Menopause is like the, the cessation of fertility. It's, a, it's rather abrupt. It's a, like an event that you can put on a calendar. Now, men do have a decline in testosterone. It's gradual throughout the years, but there's no true male menopause. But yes, they do lose blood flow to their genital area, too, with aging. But we have a you know, profound change in blood flow. The clitoris actually shrinks. The, you know, sounds scary, right? But these are, these are physical changes that are going on that affect our sexuality. Um, and then if we think about this menopausal stage is really complicated. Right about the same time, many of us have kids who are leaving home or in the difficult teenage years. Um, we might have parents who are aging and needing our help or dying. We might be having chronic illnesses, cancer, you know, other chronic illnesses that are affecting our health. All of this is happening at the same time. Maybe at the same time, you've reached the top of your career and you don't like it and you're looking for a new job. You have midlife crisis type stuff happens right at this time. So it's a conglomeration of events that can make us feel like we're going crazy. Our relationships often are starting to fall apart. And this isn't the case for everyone, but quite commonly, people stay together until their kids leave them at high school and then all of a sudden they get, realize they're not connected anymore. So this all happens around the same age. So we think about all of these things happening at the same time, it's no wonder it's a challenge, right? It's a challenging time. And, and I, you know, we need to think holistically of the whole person, of all of these things going on. If I have a patient coming into the office complaining of hot flashes, that's the surface. Like, you know, we want to look at the whole person, like what else is going on in, in your life. And there's a lot of things most likely are happening right now. Uh, a little bit about men. I'm not an expert in men, but like, often men are having some sexual dysfunction at the same time. And we all have learned about ED because it's on TV every five minutes, right? But the pharmacologic industry has invested billions of dollars in helping men with their sexual dysfunction. And just a teeny tiny bit for women, but that's starting to change. But often right around the same time, uh, you know, men are losing interest too or having trouble. And so that's put that with the list above. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, and it's not always just with us. We tend to take the blame for everything, right? But you know, it takes two to tango. So I talk about this, like what's normal. So uh, looking at large studies I've mentioned, um, having intercourse once a month is normal. Now I'm not saying that's ideal. In fact, I think it's not ideal if we want to have a strong connected relationship. And many studies, including mine, that did come out as being the most common frequency. And like I mentioned, eight out of 10 of the women would just as soon not even do that. So if you're in that group, you're normal. Now I think that uh, that's, again, not ideal. There's a, there's a healthier way to live if you want to. And I also know a lot of women who just are totally fine not having sex, and that's great too. It all depends what you want. Most of that eight out of 10 women wanted it to be different. You know, they, they wished it was different, and their spouses did too. So, it, you know, there's an elephant in the room in most cases where it's something that's difficult to talk about, but both, both members of the couple usually want to change that. There's a willingness to make it, I'm not gonna say better because it's judgmental, but different. More frequent would be the most common request. Okay, so this is really interesting. This is part of my study. If you are trying, if you're young, right, you're 20 and you're looking for a partner, what are some of the attributes that you're biologically looking for? Fit. Fit, right. Good. Strong. Strong. Like, so, yes, wise. Like, why do we? Tall. So tall. Can, yeah, why? So, why? So, 
they can take care of the baby. Exactly, because we wanted someone to be taking care of the baby, so we're looking for someone. You guys said fit, strong, handsome, maybe smart, good provider. These are things we find sexy in our 20s. Any, anything else? Good teeth. Yeah. Good teeth? Yeah. <laughs> good stamina. Stamina. We want good, want free material, right? In our 20s, our biological brain is looking for good, free material. Now, when we're not fertile anymore, <laughs> What do you think the number one answer women gave when they're not fertile anymore to what they think is the most sexy thing their partner can do? Oh, I'll just talk about eye contact and listening. It has nothing to do with those other things. Eye contact, listening, acts of service. You know, these kind of things to do with connection. Those are things that we find sexy. If your partner looks at you in the eye and says, tell me about your day. How are you, how are you feeling today? Like all of oh, you did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely helps. So 
slow lift and release, and if you went to the gym, you do what time, and then you do another side. And I, to, to have a benefit from Kegels, you've really got to do that, and it's very hard. Now, you, I've had some patients who set like a timer on their phone, and they do you know three sets of 10 in the morning, and three sets of 10 at night, and it, uh, the, it's, first of all, uh, has, anyone, has anyone done this? Uh, you can, yeah, so the easiest way to do it is if you've got something in the vagina that you're squeezing around, because otherwise we just squeeze our butt. Like if you try to do one right now, you can do it sitting down, just give it a try. It's a very common uh, natural thing to squeeze your gluteal muscles, and that's not the idea. Sometimes we'll advise patients to try to do what you do when you're trying to stop a stream of urine. Or I find the easiest thing to do is to put something in the vagina and then squeeze around it. And we've all got different things that you can put in the vagina, your thumb will work or anything that you have at home, and then squeeze around it because that'll actually give you that sensation. Mm -hmm. And so what we do with that is we are strengthening those muscles of the pelvic floor. Uh, you, physical, we have some physical therapists at Women's Hospital who can help with that to give some additional <coughs> uh, training. Um, thank you, I have my 10 minute warning. Um, but uh, physical therapy can be done on your own. You, the benefit from that is variable. Uh, it can be beneficial to some extent, but it's not going to fix, you know, major prolapse issue or you know major muscle dysfunction. But it can be helpful. Um, so Thermiva, uh, anyone heard of this? It's a, a non-surgical option for vaginal rejuvenation. Um, we actually use it in our office. Many other physicians do too. Um, and I was going to bring the probe, but I'll just illustrate for you. Um, it's the, there's a probe about the size of this uh, little thing. Um, it has a little heating pad on the end. It's heated with radio frequency, so uh, it gets to a temperature of 120 degrees, which would burn you if I let it sit on your skin. But if we move it back and forth inside the vagina, so here's the vagina. We do five minutes on the posterior <coughs> side, and five minutes on the right, five on the top, five on the other side. Uh, so 20 minutes of, of generating heat inside the vagina, and what that does is uh, intentionally causes some microscopic damage. It doesn't burn on light laser, so you don't see you know, tissue burning, um, but it feels you know, a little bit hot, uh, and that uh, generates collagen. Uh, so collagen comes in, or blood flow comes in to help with that healing process, and if we're putting more collagen in the vagina, it uh, takes the vagina and makes it a little bit snugger, if you can see what I mean. Just like if you injected collagen in your lips, um, it's putting more collagen in underneath that um, vaginal tissue. Um, what it also does is it's stimulating more blood flow on the anterior side of the vagina. You know, that's where I'll, we don't really know about the G-spot, but some people feel that they have a sensitive spot on the anterior, I mean, the top side of the vagina, right? So uh, that's right where all those clitoral nerves go, um, <coughs> that it can increase sensation. It also increases moisture. So for patients who can't take estrogen, it's another alternative for increasing moisture because then bringing in all that extra blood flow, the extra collagen, it can improve moisture, sensation, and a little bit of vaginal tightening. And then we also treat the outside around the clitoris and it has the same effect. Um, I actually, before we put that off, I um, did this uh, myself as a patient and really did find some benefits. So it's not a voodoo. The downside of it is it does wear off. Uh, so when we, just like if you have collagen or Botox, you know, it, it doesn't last forever. Um, so it is an option for patients to consider um, if other things haven't worked or if they want to avoid surgery. So it's not for everyone. I would say at least 50% of patients who come in to talk to me about Thermiva, I tell them they're not a good candidate. They, they need surgery or they would do just fine with estrogen. So it's absolutely not for everyone that it is an option. Uh, surgical options. Uh, so, you know, some patients come in and tell me, I just want my vagina tighter. <laughs> That's it. I want my vagina tighter because I feel like that would improve friction with intercourse. That is my only complaint. I don't have stress incontinence. I don't have pelvic pressure. I don't have any problems with bowel movements. On exam, they don't have any significant cystocele or rectus, you know, prolapse issues. They just want the vagina tighter. There's no medical problem but they want the vagina tighter. So the process of surgical vaginal rejuvenation is again, not for everyone. Some patients need correction of a cystocele or they really have prolapse, they need a medical problem or they have stress incontinence. But for patients who don't have any of that and they just want their vagina tighter, the first thing I ask them is, do you like vaginal intercourse? Because if they say no, I'm like, well, there's no point in doing it. If, you, if you're in that 50% of women who 
only have an orgasm from direct clitoral stimulation, which is a large group of women, and the vaginal intercourse is like this for men, could take it or leave it, I wouldn't do it because that's not gonna help you. Um, you know, still, if you only like direct clitoral stimulation, then that's great. Uh, but for patients who feel like through childbirth, they've had you know, three or more kids, the vagina's relaxed, um, you can make the vagina tighter surgically, and it's a very similar surgery to uh, the surgery that we would perform for treating uh, prolapse if the patient has cystocele or rectocele, although it's directed more to creating a certain tightness for the patient that we can you know, somewhat customize based on her desire. So that is out there, again, not at all recommended for everyone, but it can be helpful for certain patients. Um, so vaginoplasty is, you know, any kind of plasty is a reshaping off, you know, rhinoplasty, abdominoplasty, reshaping the vagina to the patient's desires to, to tighten it. And then uh, perineoplasty or perineoplasty is uh, tightening just the opening. So we're not going all the way uh, to, through the length of the vagina. It's a much smaller procedure. Just tightening the opening so it can give the patient a more of a pleasant cosmetic result. I don't know how many of us look down there, but you'd be surprised some patients really care how that looks. Uh, just to bring the, the perineal body of the area between the vagina and the anal opening, bringing it together so that um, she can have a little bit more tightening um, on insertion with intercourse. Okay, so that is all I have to talk about. And I want to open it up for any questions because I hear I only have five minutes left or comments or how does it sound for you guys? Has anyone had any experiences that they want to share? Yes, ma'am. So, from what I'm remembering, pretty much everything that you mentioned is like a lot of different stuff that I've heard of. <coughs> I didn't really say very much of anything about hormone therapy. Yeah, is that because <coughs> they have time? Pardon me? Because I didn't have time. I'd love to talk about hormones. Hormones are bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was. Uh, like everything, the pendulum swung too far. Now the, now the pendulum is swinging back to you know, where it, I believe, should be in the middle. In fact, hormones are safe for the great majority of women. There's an enormous benefit from hormone replacement, um, with few exceptions. There are, there are some exceptions for patients who should not take hormone replacement, like if you've had a heart attack, stroke, breast cancer, not very many others. Um, almost, almost everyone can benefit from hormone replacement. I take it myself. So, Things have changed, and, and that study was looking at a product that is rarely used now. You know, Premarin, do you guys know where that comes from? Premarin, yes, pregnant mares urine. <coughs> yeah, that's not even close to what we produce in our bodies. Like, so who knows what, and it was taken orally. So right. in the study, went through the liver. The liver makes blood clotting factors. There's a lot of different uh, factors that uh, are different now in the way we prescribe hormones. So absolutely, we want to be careful. Uh, I have patients who've had breast cancer who choose to take estrogen. They're counseled. Uh, I myself will take estrogen if I get breast cancer because my life was so quality was so poor when I didn't take hormones. So I think um, it's an individual decision. It's a risk-benefit analysis for each patient, and everybody's different. Uh, but the great majority of patients uh, can take hormones safely uh, if we follow you know, you know, safe guidelines and are careful. And I you know, ask the patient what she wants. I don't tell people what to do. Yes, ma'am? Do you think there's a significant <coughs> lower risk than just taking like localized estrogen versus oral? So if we told you you shouldn't take hormones because you have a 50% risk of throwing a blood clot, yes. would it be okay to try like localized estrogen versus oral? I, or or <coughs> it's not the same either way. What, you're, that's a really good question. It's not the same. Uh, now, there are some products we can use vaginally like Estrain, which is a, I don't know if you guys have seen, it's a plastic ring that has estradiol in it and it goes in the vagina. That particular product has been shown to stay almost 100% below the waist. So patients with breast cancer can use a strain and their breasts are not affected. So that's a very, very local. Now cream, for example, you put cream in the vagina, you do see a, a shot upwards in the bloodstream of, of estrogen. So we want to be careful what product we choose. And there are some other products that are, are safe for breast cancer, like Ospina, which I don't know if you know is a, a rather new product that has come out. It was originally designed as a bone builder, but it was shown to have a beneficial effect on vaginal dryness. And it's, very similar to tamoxifen, and although they can't come out and say this yet because their studies are not done, it probably decreases the risk of breast cancer. So there's a lot of stuff coming out now that can help women. There's really nobody who needs to suffer with vaginal dryness, even if she's a breast cancer patient, even if, you know, there's an option. Yeah. There was that, like, hot flash or something. Yeah, so it's 
something more systemic? Yeah, so that's a really good question. If you just use, it's going to help this, but it's not going to help your brain. So it's, it's a really tough problem for patients who cannot take systemic estrogen. I don't mean a pill, but I mean like a patch or something. That's, uh, because that's uh, really going to help with those hot flashes. And sometimes we'll explore it. And this is way less ideal. I hate to even mention it, but some of the antidepressants, right. like a buxar, right. not my favorite. And I think you're curing one side effect and creating five more. But that can be, you know, just depending on how bad those hot flashes are, that that can be an option. But something like a vinyl dot or something can help with hot flashes. Absolutely. Oh, yes, yeah, so the patches are great for hot flashes. And, and what about the liver? Because they're transdermal. Yeah, they're they don't go through the liver. liver. They yeah. do? No. no. Liver is oral. Oh. So transdermal estrogen, like the bivalve dot, which I have one on. If anyone wants to see it, I'll show you. It's the size of a uh, dime. You can't see it. I swim five times a week. It does not come off. I mean, it's saved my life. I love it. And it does not go through your liver. It goes directly into your bloodstream. I always say, like, your ovaries did not dump estrogen into your stomach. They dumped it into your bloodstream. You know, I recommend not taking it orally. Yes, ma'am. So, so my question is, is all of this applicable to surgical menopause? Uh, yes, yeah, so if we go through, so, so we have our ovaries taken out uh, surgically, we go through menopause overnight. That's a really tough thing to happen. I mean, normally the menopause process happens rather slowly over years. So a patient who has uh, goes through surgical menopause, unless she has a contraindication, I would stick a patch on her at, um, post up day one. It takes a couple of days for the hormones to dissipate, but th that patient's going to really struggle. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so once you start taking the hormone replacements, how long should you take that for? I've been taking them for like at least 15 years. Uh, so a great question. I'm going to take mine forever. I yeah, don't have to stop. Um, so there's no consensus on that. Uh, often people go back to, uh, and I'm not an academician, so I, I, you can tell already I treat more based on common sense and, and what patients are saying. If you go back to the Women's Health Initiative, which was all ancient, very poorly you know, don't even get me started on that study and the way it was analyzed. Um, but there was some suggestion that, you know, obviously the longer you take it, those risks do go up. Yes, that's true. But, but there's no time you have to stop. And I've heard physicians say you need to stop at five years or 10 years or some arbitrary number of years. Every year when you come in to see your doctor, we reevaluate your health, your risk factors. If everything's still okay, we keep going. I'm going to take mine. I'll have mine on in the coffin. Um, and, and that's that's perfectly fine if the patient chooses to do that. It's a constant process of reevaluating where the patient is, talking about her. Uh, sometimes I'll tell patients, hey, try stopping it for a month or two and see how you feel. If you feel great, good for you. You don't need it anymore. If you feel like crap, stick it back on. So sometimes we do an experiment where we'll try going down on the dose a little bit, see how we do as we get older. If you, that doesn't work, go back up again. So you can, is there a benefit for coming down on the dosage? That's or, a, I you know, really don't know. Uh, so no one has ever said that uh, all of these products are low dose. So the product I'm wearing now is a low dose. There is a lower dose one. There's really no science to suggest that if I went to the lower dose, my risk would be lower. Uh, but there's common sense, and there's no studies to support this, but common sense is we want to be on the lowest dose that works with any drug, right? So if I could be on a lower dose and it still worked, yeah, that would be, but would it help ultimately? I don't know. But we do want to always get patients on the lowest dose that works, whatever that is. So that's a really good question. So you said it's the same with the oral too? With the oral, I would, I honestly counsel all my patients to get off of the oral. But yes, the same same things would apply. I would question why you're taking oral. It's um, not my favorite for those reasons because it goes through your liver um, and it, it's you know hard on your liver. Hormones uh, create a lot of work for the liver, and there's an alternative that. You know, you're getting one pill a day, right? Mm -hmm. With a patch, you're getting a little bit all day long, so it's much more physiologic. I, I call that my little ovary. It's like doing what my ovary used to do. <coughs> you, know, you get the shot up once a day and then it goes down. It's more physiologic. So, you know, the word natural has been misused and it's a marketing term. It's, a, it's a, not a great term. It doesn't have any scientific meaning, but it's more natural. It's like more physiologic, right? Now, the patches that don't have that's, that's right. There is a, that, yeah. So you have to take that on. Yeah, so, so, that's true. so we want to, uh, if the patient has a uterus, we give estrogen.
restaurant by now. That's much less uh, uh, of a work for your liver. And because the progesterone isn't particularly designed to alleviate any symptoms, the estrogen is what's doing all of the work. The progesterone is just preventing problems. Right. Uh, so uh, nat natural, when I say again, I don't like the word natural, but natural progesterone means it's actually progesterone. It's not a lookalike like Provera or Progestin or anything to call progestin, but not actually progesterone. Um, progesterone makes you sleepy. Um, we know that when you get pregnant, because you're really sleepy. So progesterone is really high. So progesterone is actually often taken at night, and it can help people sleep. Uh, but yes, uh, at the current time, there's not a patch that has bioidentical uh, estradiol and progesterone in it together. And if you don't have any ovaries, you can take unopposed estrogen. If you don't have a uterus, a uterus. you can take estrogen by itself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what about uh, testosterone? Where does that play? That's a good question. So there's uh, testosterone. The only benefit of giving testosterone to women is uh, to potentially increase their sex drive. Uh, there's been many, many studies done on testosterone replacement for postmenopausal women, and it's just a teeny bit better than placebo in a couple of studies. So, not a big player. So, I would give a patient estrogen, progesterone if necessary, and then if, if she still wants to experiment with something that might improve her sex drive, we can try some testosterone. I can tell you in my experience, it does not work in many women. Okay, uh, uh, when is your, when, I'll tell you what mine was. When was your highest sex drive? Teens, early 20s, and how many of us were taking birth control pills during that time? Okay, so when you're on birth control pills, your testosterone is almost unmeasurable. It's so low. Birth control pills drop your testosterone. We don't, our sex drive is highest when our testosterone is really low. So the idea that we need testosterone to have a good sex drive really is false. If you give a patient more than just a tiny bit of testosterone, we also can have some really unpleasant side effects. Oily skin, acne. If you take too much, it can even lower your voice or make your clitoris get bigger. So I'd be very, very careful uh, giving testosterone. And I do use it. Uh, it has to come from a compounder. You can't, you can't get it from a regular pharmacy um, in a teeny tiny dose. I've had several patients find that it was beneficial. Uh, but again, going back to the libido's up here, uh, you know, there's just not a pill to fix our libido. It's, it's more to do with building that connection, that you know, relationship. Like I said, the sexiest things. When I said, when I said listening and eye contact, everyone in the front row went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need testosterone. I just need a date night. Being that they're not. Right, exactly. Right. So, um, we're doing it, and that takes two. Some of our spouses might not be interested in doing that work, but hopefully if we're with a partner that, I mean, they're going to get something out of it too, aren't they? If we're having sex more than once a month and enjoying it. So it works for everybody. Yes. Question about the term you got. So you said it wears off. So it's yes. like both of you keep coming back and yes. four, six months to do it? That's a good question. So the, the standard uh, for me, the treatment would be once a month for three months. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, hitting that tissue, build up some collagen. That takes some time. After about a month, do it again. That takes some time. So this doesn't happen overnight. These are changes that happen over you know, a month or two. After three treatments, it's been shown that you don't get any further benefit. So um, you have to, some patients only get one treatment in their break and they don't come back. But we recommend three. And then after some period of time, now this is a rather new technology, so the current recommendation is six to 12 months or whenever the patient says, yeah, that kind of wore off. Then they come back and do one treatment, generally. But you can, I mean, you can make up the recipe. I do one every three months, and then one, whatever she, I haven't done a year ago, and I don't feel like I need to do it again. Is that in my head? Who knows? But it, hey, it works, so I'll take it, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Mona Lisa is, a, uh, is another product that's out there, which is laser. Uh, it's a very good treatment for improving um, vaginal dryness. Um, it hasn't been shown to have the other effects that I mentioned. It's a very good product. Uh, I don't personally use it because it burns. It's very painful, requires some local anesthesia. I mean, laser, if you guys have worked with laser, it's burning the tissue. I mean, you're basically burning the inside of the vagina and then letting it resurface. So much more recovery, much more painful, but it is another good option for patients who, I uh, generally use that in breast cancer patients, patients who just really cannot take estrogen. But this is a little bit gentler. But that is also a very legitimate, good product. So over-the-counter creams at Walgreens would do what? 
Um, over the counter, you can't get anything with uh, estrogen in it. You can get some, I think, with what? Phytoestrogen, plant based estrogens like soy, black cohosh, yam, whole, red clover. There's a whole bunch of options. They work a little bit, but not as well as pharmacologic products. So I tell patients if they work for you, done. That's great. If anything works, that's great, right? I'm getting this.